Catmill, everyone. If you've been following my stream for a while, you may have occasionally seen me dip into Gwent, the Witcher card game. And if you've ever played Gwent yourself, you'll have, of course, seen the leader cards as well. Now, not every leader card is as well known to those of you coming fresh from The Witcher 3. In fact, some aren't even known to those only familiar with the games in general. So, today I'm going to give you a very quick rundown of the leaders, who they are, and a little bit of their story. Though characters like Amir or Eredin will eventually get their very own video all to themselves, of course, this should give you some insight before that happens. I'm not including the newly announced leader cards here yet, as honestly I have no idea if they've all been announced just yet and Powell isn't returning my calls, so that'll have to wait for another time. So, let's start off with Skellige. Sit at my table and let's drink! King Bran was the king of Skellige even during the events of the first Witcher stories, Although, not consistently. When Calanth of Sintra sent out invitations to possible suitors for her daughter, Pavetta, Bran sent his brother, Ice Tursak, and his nephew, Krakan Krait, to attempt to win her hand. Of course, that didn't happen, but Ice did end up marrying Calanthe instead. Due to this sudden marriage, Bran handed Ice the crown of Skellige as well. Unfortunately, that too wasn't meant to be. During the First Northern Nilfgaardian War, Ice Tursach fell in the Battle of Marnadol, and the crown reverted back to Bran. His rule was a prosperous one, but when he felt he was growing too old for the crown, he armed himself with a knife and left for the woods to hunt a bear. Needless to say, that didn't end well, and he died in combat. You've got the heart of an uncrate. As said, Krakan Krait was once sent out to Pavetta's feast to ask for her hand in marriage. As that didn't quite work out, he instead seems to have turned to... Ahem. Enjoying his youth. He's had a relationship with Yennefer of Vengerberg before, and he wasn't shy with hitting on other women either. Even when he eventually married not one, but two women. One of them also birthed him a son, Hjalmar who seemed to hit it off quite well with Ciri, and they even had a thing for a while, planned to elope together. But that, as seems to become tradition, wasn't meant to be, of course. And when the war broke out and Aistiosach died, Krak swore bloody vengeance on the Nilfgaardian invader. He would hound their harbour towns tirelessly, gaining the nickname Tieth Ismuya, or Wild Boar of the Sea. Until the very end, Krak's bloodlust never abated. Although his death did not come at the hands of an Ilfgaardian. He was cut down in single combat by Eredin Brea Glass, leader of the Wild Hunt. Here's the better loot than in your wildest, wettest dreams! Much like we'll see in Nilfgaard's leader list, it's hard to find leader-worthy figures in Skellige as, though the different Jarls certainly rule in their own part of the Isle, there is only one King of Skellige. And so it is that Harold the Cripple, or Harold and Crate, is entirely a Gwent addition to the Witcher world, so he doesn't have a backstory other than what you already know from Gwent. He's called the Cripple due to a bear mangling his leg and the bone healing back crooked. After that, each step caused him agonizing pain which, for some reason, made him fight better rather than worse. I suppose, if you're into that. Ested Esakrisa. Eredin Brea Glass originally wasn't the leader of the NL. He was merely, I use that word lightly, the leader of the Diagruri, the Red Riders. Seemingly the elite military branch of the NL elves, they were well recognized by their scarlet cloaks. Occasionally, Eredin would lead his Red Riders across the world of the humans to steal away younglings to use as slaves. When Ciri found her way to Tianalia and met Eredin himself, the elf tried to persuade her to give Oberon, the King of the Elders, a very potent stimulant. You see, 
As Eredin put it, Oberon would not take the potion himself, as the old elf was too proud to admit that he simply couldn't perform in bed any longer. This scene is purposefully vague, as is the ending. The potion, which Eredin later manages to give to Oberon anyway, ends up killing the king due to its potency. When Ciri tells Eredin what happened, Eredin seems genuinely surprised by this result. Whether or not his expression of shock was genuine, we'll never know. We certainly can't trust Avalach's visions. But what we do know is that Eredin will do anything and everything to gain control of the Gate of the World once more, allowing the NL to invade other worlds. To this end, he needs Ciri, as she is the only one capable of opening the Gate through her Elder Blood. Sounds complicated? Well, Eredin is a complicated guy, but suffice to say he's somewhat power-hungry. Not that it mattered in the end, as he was cut down by Geralt's blade in single combat. The Unseen Elder is one of the most ancient vampires in existence. As vampires grow in power with age, along with being ancient, the Elder is also exceptionally powerful. He doesn't ever leave his cave in Toussaint, where he guards the gate to the vampire world. Hoping against all hope that one day, the portal will open once more and he can go home. Vampires have all the time in the world, of course, so he doesn't exactly lose much by it. When Geralt confronts the Elder through one of the possible paths, if pushed too far, the Elder immediately kills Geralt with ease. Regis, likewise, is no match for this ancient creature. Best not to bother him in his cave anytime soon. Dagon is a bit of a strange duck in this pond. You can't exactly talk to him, nor does he openly lead monsters into battle. He leads one specific faction, silently, for the most part, and those are the Vojinoi. Dagon, of course, is very likely based on the Dagon from Lovecraft stories, and in those stories, Dagon also leads a race much like the Vojinoi, namely the Deep Ones. I suppose in true fashion of the Great Old Ones, Dagon works in mysterious ways, and we only really see him in The Witcher 1, where we summon, fight, and kill him. Though, as in Lovecraftian lore, any Deep One could grow to the size of Dagon if given enough time. Perhaps the Vojinoi simply turn into another Dagon over time, and we'll never be truly rid of him. I shall not repeat Emir's mistakes. John, or Jan Calvait, was only mentioned twice in all before Gwent came about, where he is pictured as a successful leader that relied heavily on his alchemists and mages. Unfortunately, as not all too much is known about Nilfgaard, it's tricky to find leader-worthy individuals for the Nilfgaardian faction, bringing us to people like Mr. Calvait. In the books, it's stated that he was emperor during the year of 1301 at least, following Emperor Morvan Vorhis's reign. He cleared the name of a man falsely accused of embezzlement by Morvran, and he, most unfortunately, elevated a Dominic Bombastus Hovenagel to Viscount. Dominic is known to us, the reader, as the cousin to Leo Bonhart. And both Leo and his cousin were horrible, vile creatures. It seems old Calvite wasn't a very good judge of character. Patience is not a virtue I am known to have. Of course, the most well-known of the three, Amir Va Emris, Deathwen at an Incan ep Morvut, the white flame dancing on the barrows of his enemies. His father, the rightful emperor at the time, murdered in a coup. Amir was cursed to look like a monster by the usurper and fled the lands. With the help of Pavetta of Sintra, who fell in love with him, the curse was broken and Pavetta soon gave birth to their daughter, Cyrilla of Sintra. In the meantime, Vilgefortz had also found Amir and told him of the prophecy surrounding Ciri, 
and a string of plots followed that ended in Ciri escaping back to Sintra, Pavetta accidentally drowning, and Emir returning to Nilfgaard to claim his throne. Northern Nilfgaardian wars soon exploded into the foreground as the now Emperor of Nilfgaard attempted to expand his territory. But, of course, Emir had not forgotten the prophecy. Cyrilla's child would be the queen of the world, and Emir wished for that queen to be born in Nilfgaard. So began a chase from all sides to find and capture Ciri, the Emperor of Nilfgaard, one of its fiercest hunters. Not all battles need end in bloodshed. Morvran Vorhis is in fact related to Emiava Emris through some faraway bloodlines, which, yes, would mean that Ciri technically marries into family regardless of who she marries, Emir or Morvran. Mr. Vorhis, however, does eventually ascend the throne, and as there is no mention of Ciri at that time, we can assume that Ciri went along her merry witcher ways instead of marrying anyone, leaving Morvran to deal with the Empire. Although, even before Emir's eventual departure, there were already plenty of plots to put Morvran onto the throne a bit earlier. Morvran, as a member of the Guild of Merchants, denoted by his chain necklace, would be a much better fit for quite a few influential people in Nilfgaard. Morvran was to become their little merchant puppet, in the end, however, after Emir, Morvran still took the Imperial Throne, all on his own, with Emir's blessing. Men of Kedwen, attack! Henselt, or Henselt the Hog, or Henselt the Awful No Good Raper of Women and Hater of Non-Humans, was the King of Kedwen. His troops took to calling him the Unicorn, after the Kedweni royal line. Throughout his rule, he was stubborn, but a strong military leader, often taking up a sword and fighting alongside his soldiers. He was famously hot-headed and racist, which didn't earn him much respect among his fellow monarchs, who looked upon him with pity most times. This might be why he always blustered loudly and attempted to expand the Kedweni territory towards Edern during the war, though he didn't get to keep those lands in the end. Childless after his only son died in a hunting accident, Henselt's line was destined to end with him, slain either during the Battle of Vergen by Vernon Roach or during a short war with Redania. With the last of the unicorns defeated, Kedwin was now Redanian. Onward! Attack! Full Test of Temeria seemed known to most people for one of two things. His incestuous relationships with his sister, or his miraculously ever-expanding kingdom. The sisterly love got him in trouble when their daughter was cursed by a jilted lover, turning the little girl into a terrifying striga. It took Geralt of Rivia's witchery prowess to break the curse the first time and the second time when it reared its ugly head again. Not the worst of the lot, Foltest showed some leniency towards non-human races and seemed genuinely decent towards his soldiers and servants, even taking a young and abandoned Vernon Roach under his wing when he was found alone on the streets. Though he too agreed to the plan to coax Nilfgaard into a war of their own making, a war the North eventually won at great cost to their economic strength. In the end, Unfortunate Foltest became the target of Letho of Gullet, a pawn in Nilfgaard's plans to conquer the North. And he died, having just been reunited with his children. It is how I punish those who irritate me. Radovid of Redania had the misfortune of growing up in a land full of turmoil. When he was but a child, he was put under the care of Philippa Eilhart a harsh teacher that taught him to always look his enemy in the eyes. During that same childhood, his father was murdered by an assassin, his mother was shoved aside and ignored by everyone, and a deep-seated anger grew inside of little Radovid V. After the Second War of the North, Radovid, still a child, 
bitter once again that he, his mother, and his dead father were all forgotten, swore that he would pay all the insults given to his mother and him, and in the end, he would go down in history as Radovid the Stern. Though, given his antics, Radovid the Mad would be more apt, perhaps. Nothing like a dwarf to get you to a tight spot. Brauver Hoch was the governor of Mahakam. During the Second Northern Nilfgaardian War, he sent a regiment of dwarven infantry to aid the North in fighting the southern invaders. Quite frankly, if these dwarves had not been a part of the war that day, things may well have turned out differently for the North, given their stubborn refusal to die. They held the line against all odds, preventing Nilfgaard from cutting through around the northern troops. However, this willing participation in the war didn't always come easy. You see, Brauverhoch had absolute power over the dwarven clans, and when it looked like too many dwarves were choosing the side of the Skoyatel during the war, Brauver smacked down and started smack-talking the squirrels and all who ate at them, in an effort to keep other dwarves from running off. Dwarves running off, you see, was costing Brauver money, and he didn't like that. This is likely why he also joined the war in the end, to stop the Squiatel from existing altogether. He simply ignored the humans' retaliatory measures. The pogroms included, of course. He called all dwarves that settled in towns or cities renegades, and cut them off as well. Our old friend Zoltan was not at all a fan of Mr. Brauverhoek, as even outside of politics in the general sense, Brauver made very sure to create strict laws regarding literally everything, up to and including how far away from Mahakam you're allowed to whistle and how you play the ocarina. Zoltan quite preferred his freedom. Humans have no place in Brocolon. Ethna, queen of the Dryads. Like most Dryads and Elves, she did not care for the human world, or the ultimatums they like to throw her way. Residing deep in Brocolon Forest, in the Dryad city of Duan Canal, where no human would ever venture, as Brocolon was an unkind place to all but Dryad and Elf. The first time we meet her is when Geralt comes to find Ciri near the Brocolon Forest. Young girls that enter Brocolon, you should know, belong to the Dryads as far as they're concerned. Through the water of Brocolon, they are turned into dryads themselves, and they never leave. That is exactly what Ethna had in mind for little Ciri. Even though her and Geralt had met before, and were even on friendly terms. Geralt had been tasked with giving Ethna's daughter, Moran, a daughter once. But as we all know, witchers are infertile. Now Moran lay dead and in Ethna's heart there was no room for peace with humans. And although Ciri was immune to the waters of Brocolon, Ethna would never stop fighting, until the last tree, until the last dryad. My folk have suffered much. Francesca Finderbear, or Enedanglena, is the sorceress queen of the Shea. She rules as a duchess from Dolblathana, the free elven realm, stationed there by the grace of the great son of Nilfgaard. Needless to say, that isn't entirely to the liking of the elder race. Unfortunately, they don't have a great deal of choice in the matter. Francesca only regained control of Dolblathana because she sided with Nilfgaard during the Second War. At Thanet Isle, she and Vilgefortz attacked the northern sorceresses and caused the massacre the island is now well known for. But even after siding so openly with Nilfgaard, they still weren't seen as equals, of course. And to further Nilfgaard's plans, Francesca was ordered to command the Scoyatel to keep fighting, even after they were given Dolblathana. When Nilfgaard eventually lost the war, the Scoyatel were subsequently sacrificed to the north. The commanders of the Vryhead Brigade, the elven unit of Nilfgaard, sent to be executed, and the Scoyatel units, scattered after the war, banished from Dolblathana. The Scoyatel, of course, blamed Francesca Findebear, 
though these decisions were out of her control. But the elven sorceress is not so easily defeated, and eventually she will find a way to save her people. There, now you know a little more about who's leading your deck of cards. See you again when the new leaders are here. Va fail! <laughs>